<laughs> You've been listening to me for the past half an hour. So, uh, so I think that everybody can catch up. So um, I wear a couple different hats at, at, at Sodius Willer. One of the, the hats that I wear is to be able to make sure that we um, deliver products to our customers and get them delivered in the marketplace. Um, and I think there was a little bit of us being naive uh, five or six years ago that if we follow the OSLC standard, things will just work when we go to customers. Um, I think that there's a lot of lessons that we've learned along the way. And the whole idea here is to share it with um, other tool vendors, people that have been working on uh, developing tools for OSLC, uh, as well as end users. So they understand what does it really mean when I want to connect different tools in my enterprise. So that, that's really the focus here. Um, and we'll give you a little introduction to why uh, it's interesting to be able to deploy these tools in the, in the enterprise and what we mean by that enterprise. So with that, let's kind of um, uh, focus a little bit. I know we've been talking about OSLC for a couple of days now, but the things that I want to focus on here because this is one of kind of our standard slides. Um, there's two parts about this that, that are wickedly, wickedly important. Number one with OSLC, we want to preserve repositories. So we want to have these distributed repositories across our, our IT enterprise, and we want to be approved by the enterprise itself. So this is your IT team that are managing these different tools. And what's unique when we go to deploy um, technology, whether it was our windshield connector or Jira connector or some of our custom connectors, is we were going into an existing enterprise and adding new connectivity. Um, this is dramatically different than, uh, say, deploying a Polarian system or even deploying an IBM EOM system. So while they use OSLC, they tend to be relatively monolithic in terms of they're consistent from the IT perspective and how they're deployed. Uh, something like an IBM EOM might be uh, seven or eight different VMs, but they're all in the same network segment. They're all configured the same way. They're all using the same reverse proxy up front. Um, when we add a new tool to the enterprise, it's different. Um, and so that's really what we're going to focus on here is when we're adding another tool to your OSLC enterprise to connect to one of the tools that it's already there, what happens, what takes place, what makes it difficult. Um, and so we have a bit of experience. I mean, me, me from my background, um, I actually originally deployed the IBM Jazz tools back when they were called Jazz. Uh, I think the first time uh, was at, at Panasonic back in 2009. Uh, so going around uh, 12 years ago. So back when some of this OSLC activity was initially started off um, and, and going on through for the last 12 years of doing uh, jazz deployments, doing EOM deployments, and being able to work with this. Um, we've also had the interesting experience of being able to add OSLC services onto um, several different tools. Uh, Windchill, we had a couple different iterations on that. We'll kind of clue you into what we learned along the way for that, um, as well as uh, our Atlassian solution, which actually works with a wide bevy of um, OSLC solutions, whether it's been Doors Classic or EOM or Polarian or Windchill, um, any of these different environments that we operate with, um, it has uh, various different interactions um, to be able to operate. So we've done hundreds of deployments on OSLC tooling. Um, I'd like to say that we've seen everything, um, but I actually say more along the lines of we've seen most things and, and they fall into some simple categories. So. When we work with OSLC tools, um, this is really a very simplified uh, approach to things uh, in terms of asking that question, what can go, go wrong? Or in actuality, what are the types of interaction patterns that make sense and, and operate? So we're usually looking at three different things that happen. One is connectivity and discovery. So this is just bare bones IT. How do I actually make sure that these servers can see each other? How do we have network connectivity? Um, how do we make sure that uh, your client has connectivity? Meaning that uh, when we're dealing with these environments, we need to be able to connect and interact with all of them. That's what this integration is about. Um, in addition to that, um, while uh, we, we, uh, it's necessary within the OSLC standard for us to deal with authentication and authorization. So 
How do we allow somebody to be able to see an artifact? How do we track that they've been able to see that artifact? And what are the different protocols that they might use, whether it's uh, standard form-based authentication overlaying with OAuth, or it's multi-factor, it's single sign-on. These methods, while are things that are not necessarily have to be dealt directly with our tools all the time, are something we need to be aware of when we're doing these types of integrations. And then we have the embedding and link. So, um, the beautiful thing about OSLC, it makes you feel like you have the other tool within your tool. So if you're trying to create a link from Polarian into Jira, you're going to be able to see a Jira dialogue inside an iframe within um, Polarian. Uh, the same way it goes from Jira to EOM. Same workflow. The way that we do that, we do that through web technologies and we use iframes, we embed content. And that's how we make that available. And that's how we give that smooth, seamless user experience. All these things are great things for us to have. They're also the things that drive challenges in us being able to make things happen. So um, our most basic topology that we have uh, when we're actually uh, doing any of these OSLC integrations, if we have two applications that we need to connect, um, we have three interaction points that we need to be aware of. Our client needs to be able to see application A and needs to see application B. And application A and application B need to be able to see each other. Those are the connections that we need to have. Most of the time, these are on a private network, meaning they're inside a uh, company. And all we're dealing with is two type of applications. The interactions we're trying to do, uh, we're doing the friending to be able to do the key and secret exchange in conjunction with OAuth. Uh, we need to do that uh, authorization uh, or authentication or authorization activities. We're going to embed that user experience. And we have client server and server server type interactions. For the most part, this is exactly how our lab operates and what our developers operate on. It's a really simple topology. It's very easy for us to be able to interact with. Um, unfortunately, that's not the, the environment that most of our clients actually operate. Um, we can bucket almost all the issues we have with the deployment relative to uh, three different things. Uh, and the two top two are the most important. Number one is connectivity. Can we see from one server or one application to another? Can a client see that? And are there any things that might interfere with the connectivity between those things? Um, and we'll get into <laughs> what can mess around with that, that interaction uh, in a moment. Uh, the other one happens to be around security. How do we actually authenticate? How do we actually interact with that? Those are the two points that we actually have the most issue with. Um, the last one is kind of more forward thinking as we see more teams evolve from their initial deployment several years ago. They want to do a server change. They want to do some move. So long-term consistency um, is important for us to be able to interact with. So we have uh, OSLC interactions that are uh, strong and robust. What we know and what we've observed and what we've seen is once you get an OSLC deployment deployed, it's extremely, extremely, extremely robust. It allows us to be able to interact and be able to make sure that we can um, share that content and be able to have consistent user experience. It's, it's fabulous for us to be able to interact with that environment and take, take it forward. Now, OSLC and security, this is an interesting one because it's something that evolves over time. Um, the two types of things that we're always looking for here um, is block server interactions. So uh, we're looking for uh, interactions that, kind of, that might prevent us from having access between different servers. So that can be something that uh, some of the easiest ones to detect are the things that we don't have something in our uh, domain name server. Um, so we can't actually discover a, a different server. There's also things that are more insidious, whether it's firewalls, whether it's filters, things that modify uh, content and access between servers. Those are the harder things to be able to figure out. But unless you have good connectivity between those servers and consistent connectivity, you're going to have problems with OSLC. The other place that we have issues is on browsers. Uh, our browsers tend to evolve. The security rules around browsers tend to evolve. Um, and they're trying to protect us from ourselves, meaning that they don't want us to have ads that are blocked, ads that come into us, malware that comes into us. And the things that they're going to be worried about is embedding content within another server, which is ironically exactly how 
uh, OSLC wants to be able to operate. So you need to be consistent in how you interact with that and how you be able to deploy in your enterprise and how that enterprise is operating to deal with some of the evolving uh, needs of web security, as well as what your IT team has deployed for their server security. And so what we can see is that often the goals of our IT teams can be a little bit different than those of our OSLC repositories. From an OSLC per, uh, pers perspective, the easiest connectivity is something that's very open, very permissive, um, allows you to be able to share content at will. An IT team is often uh, targeted or, or given the goal of being able to make sure that their servers are completely locked down and that nobody can have uh, unauthorized access to it, which can be done very uh, brute force and, and can be um, uh, very disruptive to our OSLC uh, interfaces. Types of things that we've seen that are just very simple is we can see firewalls between servers because uh, each application works fine on its own. Uh, it's not IT's responsibility all the time to be able to make sure that those can talk to each other. So they're naturally just as a default rule firewall between servers because it's easier for them to be able to manage security. Those are the types of things we want to interact with. Now, the hard part here is when something's not working, why is it not working? And so let's give you a little flavor on why these things can be hard to diagnose. So my first example here is one that um, showed up a while ago. Um, so this is something that when I see this now, I know exactly what it is, but it is absolutely not what my error message is telling me. So in this case, what we're trying to do is we're connecting from an IBM EOM uh, system into JIRA to be able to uh, get the feed information from TRS. And so this is to be able to do our reporting and to be able to do our indexing. We wanna be able to go and do an authenticated uh, interaction, be able to pull all the uh, information, the indexed information that we want. And it's a logical interaction. Now, what we know is OSLC is built on top of all these web protocols. So there's different things that can interfere. In this case, we were able to create relationships between JIRA and IBM from friending these applications. So JIRA can talk to Doors Next, it can talk to uh, ETM. Uh, Doors Next and ETM can talk to JIRA, no problem. The only problem here happens to be with, uh, with our TRS feed. And strangely enough, this application is complaining that it can't find a root services document that on my client I can download, all the other applications can download, just this one can't download. Uh, and when we go to check, uh, it looks like our JIRA server is providing TLS 1.2. It looks like our IBM servers are, are done uh, at TLS 1.2. Behind the scenes, we find out that the default configuration for LQE's HTTP client that's pulling this information is only TLS 1.0 and 1.1. The net result is it's refusing to download a document. And the only thing we see is an error message that says that this data source isn't found. So while that's accurate, it's not found because of a connectivity issue, it's not exactly accurate to what is actually causing this, which was, hey, we need to reconfigure this LQE client um, uh, configuration to use TLS 1.2 because it's mandatory. And that negotiation of the TLS level caused it to block. So while it looks like an issue with Jira, it's actually a configuration issue that needs to happen on another tool's point of view. Um, so being able to understand where the fault happens, how to be able to digest this information from a web level down to an application level can be a challenge um, and pretty opaque. Uh, another interesting situation that we had was that um, oftentimes we have a topology where a customer might be connecting via a tunnel, uh, meaning a VPN tunnel between uh, one cloud environment and another cloud environment. So it keeps that information private, but there's configuration at the IT level that takes place. It happened to be in this case that somebody switched their production and QA connections uh, in terms of how they appeared from the JIRA side into the uh, EOM side versus how EOM saw JIRA. So connections from uh, the, the, the EOM side to JIRA were fine, connections from, uh, from the JIRA side back into EOM 
failed saying that it was incompatible with the naming that was going on, even though we could see a root services document. When we were looking from the client level, uh, we saw exactly what we expected because we we're going a different path to be able to get to those EOM services. So this is where we kind of get this mixture between IT challenges and application challenges. Once we have an IT environment that's robust, it actually gets to be relatively easy to deploy OSLC solutions. Um, and the reason why these things are difficult to diagnose is because of this uh, overlay. It's an overlay on these web protocols. So things like, uh, and we had this actually earlier this week, uh, a 401 failure on an interaction for uh, friending between servers. Uh, intuitively, a 401 is an unauthorized. Um, this actually wasn't an unauthorized. It was just uh, effectively an internal error message that was mapped to unauthorized. It didn't actually let us get to the level of diagnosis that we want. So uh, OAuth was disabled on that server. So instead of telling us OAuth was disabled or 500 error and give us details about why it was it issuing that error, it was saying unauthorized. It leads you down the wrong path potentially of how did that interaction uh, takes place. Um, when we get into some of these web security issues, uh, we'll see symptoms like a blank window, block content, not found, we'll get uh, flashing um, login type scenarios for this, just because we're preventing the sharing of information in your web browser, or in some cases, sharing of, of session cookies between these different applications, it causes us to be able to get some kind of strange, unique type of error modes that we have to have happen. Um, and then on top of it all, when we get to the debug level, these are more developer tools, um, not necessarily your end user tools that want to be able to use this. So a lot of things need to take place to be able to diagnose that, be able to make those things happen. And so the types of things that we've seen uh, are things that we that I'll actually really fall into. How do we manage our IT enterprise? So things like mixing HTTP and HTTPS. Um, oftentimes we might have some legacy servers. We often see this on the POM side that are just doing HTTP. We have an AOM server that's doing HTTPS. Um, web browsers do not allow us to mix content and embed secure content in unsecured environments or vice versa. Uh, it really invalidates the whole idea of OSLC. So we need to be able to make sure we're consistent on that. We might have invalid certs because somebody's internal to their own network. They're not worried about that. Um, we'll block communication to content because of that. Weird things that we've had in terms of clock skew, OAuth depends on all, all of us working on the same time uh, bounds. So if we have a different clock on one application versus another, we can have some sporadic failures if they're just close enough. Um, or some of the kind of test environments where somebody's just deploying a test application using local host. When we use uh, OSLC, we're always trying to use fully complete um, uh, URLs to be able to identify resources. When we use local host, it's problematic to multiple different levels on how we use resources, how do we have links. Um, and then we get into some really wickedly interesting things when we scale up in the enterprise. So a lot of our enterprise customers that have 40,000 users or so will have things like load balancing going on. So they might have issues in terms of consistent sessions that users are accessing for OAuth, or not for OAuth, but just for OSLC in general. So being able to keep our session tokens uh, consistent, we might have some throttling of communication going on, which might affect our indexing. So if somebody starts trying to index a whole bunch of data at once, um, the throttling of, of uh, some servers might prevent that indexing to take place. So it looks like the index fails when it's actually the throttling in the IT environment that takes place. Um, all these things are things that might interact. And so we've had to be much more proactive on how we deal with this. Number one, we start to educate our customers about kind of standard basic topologies. Single domain, multiple applications, private network, these are the things that we always need to have. We need to be able to make sure you have fully qualified domain names. You need to have valid certs, standard authentication. These are the types of environments that we know um, how to be able to deploy and deploy rapidly. And we know you're not gonna run into IT uh, issues. Now, that's kind of the baseline. That's when we start doing deployment with somebody, that's the discussion to be able to help know what's a deviation from those and what the impacts are. Um, a common deviation is when somebody is using a cloud environment. What we find is that the web security is going to get involved here. It's not going to want us to embed content between different servers. 
um, because there's different changes in web browsers in the last 12 months that say that you don't want to embed content from a different site. You don't want to share cookies, which are actually our session tokens between those. And there's different things that we need to do to support that. Um, some of those are baked into our application. Some are things that we need to do at the application server level, but there's things that we need to kind of uh, help you um, change what your IT topology is so that we deal with OSLC holistically, not just from an application level, but from your whole enterprise. Um, and then that builds up when we start doing a multi-domain cloud service topology. And this is where security becomes that much more rigorous. Not only do we want to be able to work from an OSLC level, we also want to be able to make sure all those endpoints are secure and uh, the IT team can manage to know those. Those are the types of things that we engage on. Now, what's the but future of OSLC? Two, two yeah. minutes, please. Two, two minutes. All right, I can do this. Um, what are we doing about this? Uh, we're doing a lot more education with our customers a rich knowledge base on how to be able to uh, access that a lot more symptom-based diagnostic practices, meaning how do these tools break? How do they present the error? Not necessarily um, what that error directly is from that error message. So if we see uh, a, a certain side effect, we can often diagnose what that issue is from there. Um, but we tend to, to grow and add more content, more capability to that. And then the question is, is what can you as an end user or an IT organization to do? Um, it's a lot more planning. It's not just adding a plug into one tool. It's looking at your holistic architecture, have a long-term plan on how to maintain these servers, manage how these applications interact with each other um, and be able to validate your security practices in context of this, uh, this standard on top of it. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. Those are the types of things that we're, we're working on and hopefully I hit the timeline, even though my past presenter uh, went five minutes over. So yeah, I think it, I have about it, one or I two do, minutes for questions. 